I'm gonna share some awesome tips and tricks with you that I wish I had known before jumping into Jedi Survivor so you can get the most out of this game and hopefully have a more enjoyable experience during your time in the Outer Rim. I also won't be giving away any main storyline spoilers. Thanks to EA for the game code. And let's start with world restrictions because a lot of the game across all of the planets is locked behind these blocked off passageways or unreachable platforms that require new skills and abilities that need to be unlocked to actually access them. So my very first recommendation for you when you boot up Survivor is to just play the 20 or 30 hour storyline and unlock all six planets available because this will prevent you from hitting a dead end when you're on an exploration binge as all traversal powers are unlocked in the main narrative. An example of this is the jump dash ability when you pass through green shields which unlocks around 10 to 15 hours in the story and opens up a significant amount of the game in terms of exploration but that said exploration in itself is a massive XP and force power our earner in this sequel, meaning that if you decide to take a break from the main quest line to check out all the cool side quests, boss fights, and collections in each world, which I'll break down for you shortly, then you will reap the benefits of new force powers, skills, and overall effectiveness in combat due to the rapid XP progression exploration does offer you. So there is a trade-off that you need to be aware of here, which is you will earn more XP when exploring, which will open up more unlocks for you, but you won't be able to explore everything that the game has to offer you until completing the storyline. And a quick couple tips here while you're gallivanting around the galaxy, make sure when you find yourself in water, do dive beneath the surface as there's almost always a chest on the waterbed and some block passageways can be blown open with roller mines. So if you find one randomly chasing you around in a certain area, that means a door can be blown open. So take 30 seconds to look around for it on your map and then allow the roller to chase you to that doorway in question and let the force take care of the rest. Now let's go over the map navigation and shortcuts you should know about because they will make the game more enjoyable for you. They certainly did for me because fast travel will help you progress through the main story a lot faster between quests. Certainly when you're running back to hand-ins, you don't have to do that now. You can just fast travel back to the quest giver as well as exploring each planet more efficiently if you're after something specific like a bounty hunter target that you want to square away quite quickly. Now you will unlock this mechanic after reaching the planet of Kobo when you unlock two meditation points, which are the blue beams that you can see in the distance when you're on planet. So every time you unlock more meditation points, that location will be added to your fast travel network, which you can flick through for future use. But the caveat being that you will need to reach a meditation point to use this feature. You can't just use it randomly out in the world and you can't cross planet fast travel. Now, the same thing applies to shortcuts because as you continue through each planet, make sure you keep a lookout or double back on yourself during a mission because you will need to cut cable ropes or activate zip lines as these shortcuts speed up the game progression massively when you do return to this area, which you most certainly will. Now, as for mounts, these will all unlock during the storyline in the first 10 or so hours. So don't waste your time trying to proactively mount Nekos when you arrive in Kobo like I did. And I'd also encourage you to turn on navigation assist in your settings menu. This shows up as an icon on your map of where you need to go to continue the main story, which has saved me a lot of time in these labyrinth designed worlds. Now, as for combat stances, there's five here in this game where you can only equip two at one time in combat. And incidentally, you only have two stances when you start the game for the very first time, which means you'll need to unlock three more but how and when do you do that? Well, the first stance we begin with is the single blade, which is a solid all-rounder option for you in combat. The second is the double-bladed stance, which is a strong choice for crowd control. And then our third is the dual-wield saber stance that is fantastic for damage output, one of my favorites, and unlocks with the first hour or so in the storyline on Coruscant. Now, the fourth is the blaster stance, which is superb for dealing with enemies at distance and pestering them with some damage, some really cool charge shots do have a big impact here as well and this is unlocked when you reach another planet which I won't name just yet just in case you want to be surprised for yourself in game but it does become available with that conservative 10 or so hours of game time depending upon how you want to play and your difficulty settings and finally the fifth is the cross guard stance which is the most powerful 
but also the slowest, and this is unlocked on the shattered moon planet of Kobo, which again is up for grabs within that first 10 hours or so of the story. So my recommendation here is to continue to rinse the storyline until you unlock all of these, as it will give you more choice and variety on what combat style suits you for the rest of the game. Now, if you've learned something new so far, please do leave a very swift like down below. It genuinely really helps me out on YouTube, so thank you very much for your support, and do subscribe if you're new here. I've got lots more Jedi Survivor videos just like this coming to you as quickly as I can make them, so it would be great to have you along for this wild ride. Now, that stance breakdown brings us quite nicely onto a few things that you should know about when it comes to the 75 skills that you can unlock in Jedi Survivor by spending your hard-earned skill points from leveling up or completing certain side quests like the Force Terror events, which give you a skill point as a reward. But what's important to note here is you have three skill categories, Survival, Lightsaber, and force. Now, within each of these categories, you will find skill trees that are specific to a certain type of gameplay. So, for example, in the survival tree, you can spend your points to increase Cal's maximum health, which is a skill I would recommend that you should consider unlocking first, because whatever difficulty level you're playing at, it will pay dividends as a defensive insurance buffer throughout the game, as stim health canisters have not carried over from Jedi Fallen Order, and it gets a bit feisty late in the game if you've only unlocked the four available stim canister upgrades in the storyline but this is also where you're able to improve the effectiveness of your specific lightsaber stance you like to play with and what i would also suggest you do is before splashing your skill points willy-nilly or haphazardly in every tree you fancy is to try out the lightsaber stances you find most appealing first and the best way to do this is in the void training program which is available at the meditation point menu once you reach the planet of Kobo during the storyline. This will allow you to freely experiment with combat so you can make an informed decision on which two stances you would like to focus on and then you can subsequently spend your skill points in those specific saber skill trees to maximize your gameplay very early on in the game and gets you really up to speed and very familiar with how you want to play this game. I would also recommend spending your first skill points in the force and survival trees until you decide your lightsaber preference for a good return on skill investment and good to note here you can always reset your skills if you decide a certain an unlock isn't for you or it's not working for you or it's kind of wasted the first reset will be free but the second will cost you one skill point thereafter so do take your time at the start of the game and you can't really go wrong here now another new mechanic in survivor is the perk system which you should definitely take advantage of when you unlock it during the first five or so hours of the game as it allows you to add some significant and positive flares to your combat gameplay in a way that's specific on how you like to play. So for example, let's say you want to grind out XP and max out your skill tree as fast as possible for more impactful force and saber abilities. Well, if you purchase and equip the wisdom perk from the robot Z in the Kobo Cantina, it'll allow you to increase your XP gain a lot faster, resulting in more skill points to spend. In fact, I rate this perk so much, I would highly recommend that you save five data disks that you collect out in the world for this specific purchase. It's another mechanic which will incrementally pay you XP dividends via long-term use, compounding massively if you manage to get it early enough in the game. That said, there is a couple important things to know about perks. The first being that 25 of them are available for you to collect in game. And the second is that they have a maximum equip capacity of 10. This means that each perk takes up a different amount of capacity slots according to its usefulness. So for example, again, that wisdom perk fills three capacity slots, whereas this resilience perk here fills up just one because it's not as good as the wisdom perk. So with that maximum of 10 slots that you'll unlock through the storyline, it'll be up to you to manage what you think is best for your own gameplay style to equip, but definitely equip that wisdom perk as soon as you unlock Z the robot. Now there's two primary side quests you should be aware of in this game. The first one being rumors and the second being bounties. Now rumors are your generic side activities which are given to you by NPCs around the world which will send you on a variety of missions to defeat mini bosses or other substantially challenging NPCs with one of the main incentives to these quests being that as a reward you may be able to recruit these local inhabitants to then return to our cantina in Rambler's Reach on Kobo. A good example of this being when I found and recruited Pilly on a planet that I won't name, who then travelled back to the saloon and unlocked additional garden plots for our rooftop garden, making that activity a lot more easier to complete for that in-game trophy. Now, as for bounties, 
This is another side activity that will be activated during the main story in Kobo, again, around five to 10 hours approximately, where you will be approached by Cage, who will offer you 16 bounty contracts in return for a shop full of upgrades and cool gun cosmetics, which you can purchase with bounty pucks that you collect after every successful kill. In fact, when you accept a bounty contract from Cage, you then view a full breakdown of your target in the bounty menu system, including their location on your map for a very quick turnaround. So it's good fun and worth doing to break up the main narrative and to equip Cal with some new upgrades and cool cosmetic options. Now, another couple activities you may be also partial to here is the 13 optional legendary adversary boss fights that you'll most likely come across in free roam exploration, at least one anyway, and you'll need to kill all of these big boys for that I'm a living legend in the game trophy. Now you can proactively seek out each of these enemies for yourself if you know their locations via a guide, but if you are on a side quest binge, it would be more beneficial to you from a reward and XP basis to actually pick up all the rumor quests available, which are easily identifiable as this icon on your map. They frequently pop up back at the saloon, and that's because a lot of these rumor quests are breadcrumbs of sorts that invariably lead to one of these legendary adversaries as their quest target directly or as a byproduct of that quest itself. But if you want that poncho in this game, this is how you get it, as you'll need to head to the Fort Kalin meditation point on the planet of Kobo. And if you just follow this route I'm taking you through now, which I will speed up for you, you'll end up reaching this platform, which will automatically open up, and then you'll have to smash Ogdo to pieces for that poncho reward, which is a very nice nod to Fallen Order here. And while you're in combat, a cool detail to note is the lights on the back of BD1 will change colors according to your current health percentage. So it is a really great thing to look out for in combat instead of just staring at your health bar frequently in the left-hand side corner of your screen. Or for those of you who play without a HUD, this will be a really nice touch, which if you don't play without a HUD, you can actually turn off in the settings menu if you want to give that a go. Now there's a few puzzle secrets and currencies that you should know here as they can provide some really nice benefits to your playthrough when utilized properly. But let's discuss these Jedi meditation chambers first which are puzzle rooms that unlock when you reach Kobo. They're not visible on your map so you can't just run directly at them each in turn but they will reward you with new perks to equip when you do come across them and complete them as well as a solid amount of XP and providers with a selection of force echoes inside them which give you more info and a bit of lore about the High Republic era which was the golden age for the Jedi Order. They're really quite interesting to be fair. Now when you're inside these chambers I would recommend turning on the toggle hold pull button in the accessibility settings menu as this will allow you to force pull the orb with just one button press instead of running around for five minutes holding your bumper trigger so it doesn't drop out of your hand. It's a much better quality of life experience doing these if you're smashing these chambers out back to back. Now as for the force tears, these are small events that you can interact with that will provide you with a combat or platforming parkour challenge and when you complete it you'll unlock a skill points so worth doing if you run past a purple glowing orb on your screen but when it comes to currency priorite shards are found all over the world and allow you to purchase cosmetics haircuts and new music for the cantina but i recommend you spend your first 10 shards on the mysterious key code at doma's shop which opens the back room of a store where you'll get a stim canister upgrade well worth doing that now data discs are also another item to keep track of that will allow you to purchase perks from z as we mentioned earlier so if you see a gold glow through your exploration playthrough do take the time and effort an extra two minutes to pick it up as it will allow you more freedom in the perks that you want to equip now one of the great things about this sequel in my opinion is the immense customization options available and to be clear none of your outfits armor lightsaber or blast to construction parts have any statistical advantage in game. It is all purely cosmetic based with all of the offensive and defensive gameplay improvements deriving directly from skill unlocks and upgrades that we discussed earlier also. Now with that in mind, pretty much everything you loot in game will either be a cosmetic of some kind or a currency that can lead to purchasing more unique, rare and exclusive cosmetics from specific vendors on planets. An example of this being the Jedi Scrolls on a planet that I won't name again, but by collecting these and trading them into the appropriate vendor, you get some very cool 
lightsaber cosmetic designs. But that said, you will come across these red scavenger droids on several planets that hold on to valuable materials, which can bolster your cosmetic currencies to spend at vendors quite quickly. Problem is, they dig themselves underground to hide if you use the force on them or run away if you get too close. So either creep in behind them nice and slowly or hit them with a lightsaber throw if you come across one in the wild and make sure you go over to them after killing them. They frequently drop priorite shards that don't automatically loot as well as other bits and bobs. So it's definitely worth looting everything they have to offer you as it's all good stuff. You're also able to unlock the red lightsaber and party multicolored lightsaber after completing the main narrative and launching a new game plus game, which you can then access at your workbench around one hour or so into the game itself. And that's a great transition onto that topic now, because when you do start a new game, all your skills, five lightsaber stances, cosmetics, and stim canister unlocks will become available from the first mission. The only thing that won't be transferred over are those storyline force moves such as the force air dash which you'll need to unlock again due to the narrative restrictions imposed at the beginning of the game. I also want to flag this update that you need to download because patch 1.02 fixes a lot of the bugs and screen tearing with low FPS cutscenes. So proactively run a check for an update on your PC or console if you're still having issues because you may not have had the latest patch and performance may be in the toilet for you. Additionally, in the settings menu, you can turn on performance mode which targets that 60 FPS at 1440p resolution, which I found to be fairly decent after the patch update, but still not great. However, a key takeaway here is to turn this on if you want to prioritize a smoother FPS experience over the lower FPS and a higher texture quality mode at 4K. And speaking of higher quality images, photo mode is in the game from launch. Just hit the pause menu button and then press the triangle button on your controller to activate it. And I'd recommend turning off performance mode to maximize the detail of your photography skills. Now do click this video on your screen right now as I share even more tips and tricks that I think you'll find helpful and interesting in this game so hopefully see you there in just a second and please do leave a like before you go really appreciate it so thank you very much but if you're still here my huge thank you to Nika who has helped me scour this game to get the best info for you coffee is on her and I'll see you in that next video